to uh, welcome Stephen Cochran. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Colin. Great to be back. Good to see you. Uh, I watched you on screen uh, during that session with Glenn. You're watching very intently. Uh, before we get dive into China and Taiwan, what are your uh, comments on, on Glenn's presentation just now? Uh, there were a lot of issues to me that were, rather than extricated, conflated. And they're very important issues, but we have to be careful uh, not to meld all these issues together in some type of crisis of democracy narrative. Look, there is no crisis of democracy. There's quite a lot of dysfunction. Uh, but democracy is healthy. It's healthy in the U.S. It's healthy in Australia, despite the dysfunctions that he mentioned and that we, of course, know very well. So that's a good lead into today's topic because China, of course, uh, has never pretended to uh, to want to run a, a society of democracy, and yet Taiwan is a democracy, and the tensions there seem to be gathering pace, and there's even murmurings of military actions possible. Uh, you've been talking to us in this audience for many years on this particular subject. Uh, would you like to just start today, Stephen, with a bit of an outline as to what the history is between China and Taiwan and what uh, the, the precipice that we perhaps are now upon? All countries, Australia included, need the U.S. and China to work out some type of coexistence, a relationship. It's going to be competitive, uh, but it doesn't have to be war. And so in AI, in quantum computing, in biopharma, we can compete, and we can compete in a way that doesn't necessarily lead to massive conflict. Uh, but Taiwan has always been the danger, and it's become more dangerous recently. And that's because the status quo is not working for Beijing. The status quo is one China policy. Taiwan is formally recognized as part of China, but is de facto independent. It's not de jure independent, uh, but because it's formally part of China, but it runs its own affairs, and as you said, it's a democracy. That status quo is not working for Beijing because Beijing's strategy of pursuing economic integration to bring them politically closer has failed. It achieved the opposite. They're economically more integrated than before, but Taiwan has drifted politically away from China towards a Taiwanese identity becoming firmer and firmer, especially in the younger generations. So can Beijing allow Taiwan to continue to drift farther away politically? We don't know the intentions of the Chinese regime. We're only guessing, right? On the one hand, people say China needs external peace in order to continue its internal development and its breakthrough from the middle income to a higher income country. But others argue that Xi Jinping wants to be a historic figure and achieve reunification and break the US alliance system in Asia. So we don't know the intentions. What we do know is the status quo is not working for Beijing. And that brings the US into the picture because the, the fact that the status quo seems not to be working for China and China seems to be posturing aggressively has led the U.S. to reconsider its own commitment to the status quo, which is so-called strategic ambiguity. Strategic ambiguity means the United States helps Taiwan defend itself, but is not formally committed to guarantee Taiwan's security. It's ambiguous. The reason it's ambiguous is so as not to give Taiwan a blank check to do what it wants, and then the U.S. is on the hook. But now, the U.S. is reconsidering whether strategic ambiguity is enough of a deterrent to China. So here we have China unsatisfied with the status quo, and here we have the United States toying with itself changing the status quo. And so as you know, Colin, uh, intentions are never sufficient in an analysis because in something like game theory, neither side might want war, but both sides might act in anticipation of the other side's actions to lead to that very outcome that they themselves don't want. 
And so we could have here perverse and unintended consequences as each side is trying to guess what the other side wants and will do. And neither side wants the war, potentially. Once again, we don't know China's intentions, but if we assume their intentions are not warlike, we still might get to that position regardless of intentions. And so that's what worries me the most. Thanks, Stephen. Do you see any way out for China, for Beijing in this regard, without losing face? That's the problem, Colin. If you project the status quo out farther and farther, it gets worse and worse. And so the assumption is China must act at some point. And the longer it waits, the worse it becomes for the action. So sooner rather than later, many people argue, is China's best strategy if it agrees that the status quo doesn't work and is getting worse. And so that's why many people are afraid that we're on the cusp we're on the precipice even now, today, tomorrow, the next day, the next year, soon, for China to take some type of action which tries to reverse the drift politically of Taiwan away from China towards an independent Taiwanese identity. The only other option would be to just wait it out and hope that there's some type of unforeseen change on the island on Taiwan that brings a reversal in the direction that we have. In other words, patience and hope. And patience and hope were China's strategy when it was weaker, but now China is much stronger. So right now we're seeing uh, human rights atrocities uh, unfold in Myanmar, uh, formerly known as Burma. And uh, we're seeing also the, uh, the Western world not really step into this situation. It's not an economically important country. Uh, and, uh, however, we also see China sitting behind Myanmar's military in the coup of February 1. Uh, is that a lesson to how feeble the West really is when it comes to uh, a, a confrontation with China? The West is really strong in some ways, Colin. We have better political institutions because we have corrective me mechanisms. We have a much stronger private sector because the state interferes much less in investment decisions. We have tremendous universities and tremendous R&D, and the Chinese send their students to the U.S. and Australia for a reason. They send them because our universities are excellent. So the assets on the side of the West are enormous. The problem for the West is it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know yet how to engage competitively with China. It keeps saying that it needs to do that, but the specifics of the strategy have yet to coalesce. And so as long as the West doesn't do stupid things, make promises to countries that it can't keep, uh, destroy its own institutions with its dysfunction, right? with internal political dysfunction, fail to address with its own corrective mechanisms its internal issues, right? As long as the West continues to play to its strengths, it's fine. Now, with Burma specifically, where you have a tragedy, you have another Syria unfolding where you could get state failure and you could get a multiple civil wars simultaneously on the territory of a country that unravels, and very high death rates, unfortunately, like we saw in Syria. So here we'd like to see some type of intervention, and we did see ASEAN invite the coup general, the leader of the, the generals, uh, for a discussion with the other ASEAN nations. And I think that was an important invitation because they didn't recognize him as the state leader, they called him the leading general and the coup leader. And at the same time, they, they uh, demanded that he cease the violence. So it's not only up to the U.S. and the West sometimes, Colin. There are also other middle powers that have agency and that we'd also like to see step up. Now, uh, can ASEAN solve the Myanmar problem? Maybe not. But should it try? Yes. And so I found that to be very encouraging 
But like you, I'm really worried that we're on the cusp of a failed state and a multiple civil war disintegration there. So uh, Australia uh, has a new defence minister in a gentleman called Peter Dutton, who uh, yesterday uh, all but said uh, that our military was preparing for potential military action uh, between China uh, and Taiwan, uh, and that, of course, we would be supporting um, uh, the US and Taiwan in any defence. Uh, last night, our former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, who actually uh, speaks fluent Chinese and uh, now leads a Asian think tank, uh, suggested that on national media that that was completely uh, ridiculous, uh, that it was warmongering and it was uh, at the current coalition government trying to, uh, to deflect from their own domestic problems. Uh, so how, for, from the Australian investor perspective, how uh, dangerously real is the speaking of uh, military action? So deterrence is very important, Colin. The Chinese government in Beijing should understand that there would be consequences to aggressive actions, that there would be a price to pay. At the same time as we want to make sure that deterrence is communicated, we also want to make sure that there's dialogue. Not every issue is a confrontational issue. Many issues are potentially cooperative or collaborative issues. We need to communicate to the Chinese government those issues that we feel would rise to the level of potential con confrontation, but also those issues where we will accommodate the interests of China because they're legitimate interests. They have a growing economy, a large and dynamic society. They're a big power in Asia and beyond. And we recognize that. So not every issue is a confrontation, but some issues do require deterrence. And so when you combine deterrence with diplomacy, you have the leverage and the dialogue simultaneously. So I think only deterrence is wrong. And I think only appeasement, as Rudd was suggesting, is also wrong. And let's remember, the Chinese are not allowing countries to appease them. When you try to bend to Beijing, like the EU did with their trade deal, they slap you in the face anyway. The Chinese government's behavior is forcing a binary choice on many countries that don't want to make a binary choice. And so that's why deterrence is necessary to get them to climb down on some issues, but not on every issue. And so this is an adult a, a type of diplomacy and deterrence together, Colin, is basic. It's geopolitics 101. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. Takes us to this question, which is the opposite of what you just said, actually, uh, Stephen. It says, given that there are only 15 countries, the audience question, given there are only 15 countries that recognize Taiwan, all of them fairly small and peripheral, is it not incumbent on the U.S. to back down? So the U.S. does not recognize Taiwan either. Once again, the status quo is our power here. The one China policy, which cannot be changed by force. That's what we want to see. We don't want to see China invade and destroy Taiwan's democracy. We also don't want to see Taiwan declare itself independent. And so if we have a smart policy of upholding the status quo, then I think we're on strong moral and political ground. If, however, we start talking about supporting Taiwanese independence, rather than deterring Chinese aggression to change the status quo with violence, coercion, then I think we give away the moral and political advantage. So nobody should back down here. We should all be in favor of upholding the peace and prosperity of the status quo. So let's uh, involve our audience at this point. Uh, first time we've asked for you to uh, respond to a polling question. Uh, audience, you'll uh, find the, um, the uh, polling question to your right on the screen. If, uh, if you can't see that, you need to minimise your screen. The question is, fiduciary capital has a role to play in international relations and in preserving sovereignty. Returns to members can be sacrificed where it is in the national interest. Strongly agree, B, agree, C, disagree, D, strongly disagree. 
We'll give you a few minutes to respond to that. Meanwhile, Stephen, aside from assets that are domiciled in China, how else can investors leverage the Chinese growth story? I think investors are in for a bit of a rough ride here in the short and medium term. And we're in a new era of antagonism, which is here to stay. The question for investors is, will the antagonism get much worse? Because the new era of antagonism that we have now is still manageable. And so what we don't want to see is a massive deterioration of far greater antagonism where there's confrontation day and night everywhere on every issue. If it can stay at this level of antagonism and each side could learn to manage the competition, investors will survive. But you have two countervailing tendencies, each canceling each other out for investors. On the one side, you have the fact that the growth is in Asia and no institutional investor can miss that growth. You don't want to be on the sidelines in the next generation, two generations, while Asia continues to be the driver of growth. At the same time, uh, China is the ultimate G in your ESG. It's a highly repressive regime. And if you're going to adhere to any type of ESG framework, the regime is very problematic and it's not going to get better. And so how do you reconcile these two countervailing tendencies where you can't be on the sidelines for growth in Asia and at the same time you take the G in ESG seriously because you have a fiduciary responsibility to uphold those principles you sign on to. And the answer is not going to be easy in the short term, uh, but maybe better over the long term. We used to talk about what was called near China or adjacent China for investors. Near China and adjacent China meant not necessarily directly invested in China, but invested in other countries, that is to say invested outside of China, that could benefit from growth in China. And I think we're going to see money managers coming forward with a lot of suggestions returning us to the near China and the adjacent China type options. At the same time, there are many Asia investments which are unrelated to China, not near China and adjacent China, but also very promising for institutional investors. You don't have to tell an Australian audience about the opportunities in Southeast Asia, for example, which sometimes relate to China, but are mostly on their own self-standing and really important for the growth story. So there's still a lot of opportunity in Asia, and there will be even more that doesn't necessarily increase your exposure to the repressive Chinese regime, including actions that could upend your own investments, let alone the human rights story that we're talking about. So reducing exposure to Chinese risk while increasing exposure to Asian growth is really the balancing act. Long term, I'm very optimistic that investors can pull that off. In the short term, there's a rough ride there. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's very clear. Uh, I guess what's not so clear is uh, as we as investors deal with the mega trend of sustainability and ESG, uh, China has only uh, weakened uh, over this last uh, 12 months uh, in terms of the the, uh, the, the reliability of uh, any interest in governance. Um, the the uh, survey has come back uh, with, uh, I'll read it out once again, fiduciary capital has a role in to play in international relations and in preserving sovereignty. Uh, returns to members can be sacrificed where it uh, is in the national interest. Strongly agree, 11%. Agree, 53%. Uh, disagree, 32%. Strongly disagree, 5%. Stephen, any comments on that? Yeah, I think your audience has got it right here. And I think people on both sides of the issue here have a point. Just as I pointed out, Right? There is that growth that they're bound to capture. They can't sit on the sidelines. But at the same time, they have to invest with their values. And they have to uphold the covenants and other agreements that they're beholden to. And also Australia's sovereignty 
is a really important uh, uh, challenge to defend. You don't want China gaining more leverage, significantly more leverage over Australian domestic or international politics. China's goal is to bend countries to its will, to make the world safe for that authoritarian repressive regime. And so that means bending countries like Australia and ultimately Japan and uh, an even larger prospect for them to the will of China so that they think once and twice and three and four times about their own actions and how it would affect China and maybe they back off of doing things because China doesn't like it. They bend, in other words, to China's will. We certainly don't want to see any more of that. We've seen enough of that. And so regaining national sovereignty, reducing Chinese leverage, all of that is the proper, I think, approach for institutional investors, but not at the point of risking being outside the growth story in, in Australia's own neighborhood. So that can be done. It's not a simple proposition. And I, so I think your audience is clear on that point. I, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the survey results there, not surprisingly. We've got about eight minutes left, Stephen. Let's uh, let's change direction here now. Uh, you uh, had the uh, the jab last week, uh, and your uh, first vaccination, and, uh, and many around you are finding the same. Uh, in about an hour's time from now, President Biden will present for the first time to Congress uh, in his uh, first 100 days. Uh, it seems to be a fairly large tick on COVID and the vaccine rollout, and a fairly big cross against the southern border issues with Mexico and many other issues. What would your commentary be of his first 100 days? What do you think he's likely to say in the next hour? So Biden has done what we had hoped in terms of reducing the insanity, toning down the conversation to make it more respectful and less 24-7 madness. That's been very important. In addition, he's also presided over a very successful rollout of the vaccine, which I anticipated the U.S. would be able to achieve. Once again, if you're on the plane of governance, uh, the U.S. failed in the COVID-19 response. But if you're on the plane of science and biopharma and the strength of the private sector and society, the U.S. has shown its strengths, right? The U.S. vaccines are excellent and the production will only ramp up and there'll be even more vaccines and further than vaccines, there'll be some therapeutics that are coming down the line as well, which will be really important. Uh, the Chinese vaccine doesn't really work. Uh, however, China was very successful in suppressing community spread in their own way. So n now, however, we've shifted to a different plane where the U.S. is much stronger and where Biden was much more successful. The biopharma, the private sector, and society's own organization. The issue for Biden, however, going forward is what's possible within the, the constraints of the political system in a more or less evenly divided country. It's one thing to give out free money that the Federal Reserve pays for in the short term and the debt increases and more bonds, more US Treasury bonds are bought by the Fed it's another thing to rearrange U.S. domestic arrangements, socioeconomic, sociopolitical arrangements. Here, Biden has not yet been successful, and we're not sure if he's going to have success. So we'll get the economic boom uh, that's been coming uh, because the bounce back from the suppression, uh, it, it's clear it's already underway, certainly since July, maybe before already. But will we get long-term policies that are more or less permanent to address our lack of investment in infrastructure, our lack of investment in human capital, some of our governance challenges? The jury is still out on that. So Biden on tone and pandemic gets an A and Biden on fundamental structures attacking the real challenges in the society long term gets an incomplete. 
Stephen, on another topic, uh, one of the other areas for, for investors to navigate is what will the new normal look like uh, in a post-COVID world? And it's pretty hard to anticipate. My question for you, and I know you've got strong views on this, that besides, uh, you know, we have a, a limited data set actually at this point to make any determinations about what the world's going to look like. Do you think it will look that different? Do we have any evidence to suggest that COVID-19 has really changed societies and economies? I think you're right to use the word evidence, Colin. The hype is clear. All the hype has been about big changes that have already happened or are about to happen. But the evidence for that is very slight. Some trends have been accelerated, of course, and, and that happens in crises. But fundamental changes, we're still not sure, and it's a little bit early to tell. Will commercial real estate die? Will companies cease to, for example, uh, lease the kind of footprint that they had previously, right? Connexus is a good example. You gave up the office that you had, but you didn't give up offices entirely. You changed offices to better suit the company's needs going forward. So you're still invested, so to speak, in the proposition of an office and commercial real estate. So how many other companies are like Conexus in that regard versus how many other companies are really cutting the cord and going much more remote and even hybrid rather than in? We still don't know, Colin, because it's too early. So I would be cautious about making a very definitive statements. And I would say investors should watch the evidence when anybody makes a claim and interrogate the evidence on these fundamental changes. What we need to see, Colin, is reinvestment in all fundamental areas that make for success. And those are three categories, human capital, infrastructure, and good governance. If you see investment in those three areas for the long term, I'm not talking about giving money away, you know, making, sending checks home to people, making statements and pledges at international conferences. I'm talking about real action in those three areas. And, and if we get those, that action in those three areas, we've got the formula for long-term success, including structural shifts in a more positive way. Now, the private sector is far ahead of governance, ironically, when it comes to the green investments, when it comes to change, when accounting for climate risk, when it comes for assessing what the 20-year outlook is as opposed to the five-year outlook. And so that's very encouraging, but we still have a lack of investment in infrastructure and human capital and we have deteriorating rather than improving governance. And this concerns me, but we have the corrective mechanisms if we can get our act together and use them. So in 100 years from now, the, uh, I know it's a hard concept to think about, Stephen, but the professor of history at Princeton probably won't be you, it might be somebody else. Uh, what will they be teaching about this COVID-19 period in 100 years from now, or will it not even make a blip on uh, the significance of history? You know, the Black Death in the Middle Ages wiped out anywhere between a third and a half of the European population. So it's clear that we're nothing like that. There are waves yet to come. The situation in India today is very concerning. And of course, it could be, besides India, other countries that tear our hearts out when we see what's happening there. Uh, however, the scale of the disruption and the scale of the death and the horror has not been as great as it used to be in the past. And that's because we have science, we have vaccines, we have public health. In the Middle Ages, they didn't know, Colin, where the plague came from. They had no possible treatments for it. And, and so we have a leg up on our predecessors because of many of our achievements. And so the pandemic will be something mentioned 100 years from now, Colin, but much more important than the pandemic will be discussions about whether we got right or wrong, the challenges of investing in our own people, in our societies, in our governance, 
and, and keeping democracy strong. Your previous uh, panel was about how democracy has weakened itself in certain areas. And the only thing that can defeat ourselves, Colin, is ourselves. A pandemic cannot defeat us. It can cause a lot of pain, as we're seeing. But I'm optimistic about the 100 years from now, Colin, because we have the tools and because your institutional investors, your private sector people, they have the ability to help shape that future. Well, Stephen, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. And once again, I'm sure you've uh, provided plenty of food for thought for our listeners and investors today and those who watch it in the future on playback. Uh, you've got a great, uh, a great mind and always a great perspective. So thank you for your generosity and for being with us today, uh, joining us from New York. And uh, I very much hope that you and not just yourself, but your wife and children can join us next year at the same conference live in person here in the Blue Mountains in Australia. Thank you, Colin. I love the the, the staff that you've got that makes these incredible productions work. But I got to say, I wouldn't mind you kissing me on the cheek in the near future. Take care, Stephen. Thank you. Have a good day. Be Bye -bye. well. Thank you. Bye.